Hello, everyone. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you all for joining us this afternoon and evening for those of you in other parts of the world. We're at a slightly later time than normal, but we're very excited to welcome you to another installment of our Climate Change Solutions Frontline Perspectives from Around the Globe webinar series. My name is Erin Gill, and I'm a graduate research assistant with the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy, and I'll be your host for today. The Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policy, along with our partners at the World Resources Institute and Environmental Defense Fund, are very excited to host today's presentation by Dr. Rajendra Pashari. Dr. Pashari is actually with us live on Yale campus, joining us from his office at the Yale Climate and Energy Institute. His presentation today will focus on India's perspectives on climate change and climate policy, but of course, Dr. Pashari also represents a more global policy perspective due to his role as chair of the IPCC, the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. His discussion of India adds to those of past speakers from Canada, Russia, the United States, and many others in our series and continues our conversation about the climate policy perspectives of top emitting countries around the world. Before we begin, I do have a few housekeeping notes. First, please note that we will leave time for a question and answer discussion at the end of the presentation. However, because of the large number of people participating, we ask that you please submit your questions in writing using the chat feature on the right-hand side of the WebEx screen. You can send in your questions to the host at any time during the presentation, and I will compile them and convey as many as possible to Dr. Bashari. Note that when you send a question, feel free to include your name and affiliation and where you're calling us from so we can provide that information to read your question. We will also post a recording of the presentation later this week in case you miss anything. So without much further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Agenda Bashari to the series. In addition to his role as chair of the Nobel Peace Prize winning Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Dr. Bashari is also Director General of CARI, the Energy and Resources Institute, which is a major independent resource organization providing knowledge on energy, environment, forestry, biotechnology, and the conservation of natural resources. Dr. Bashari is a prominent researcher on environmental subjects and is recognized internationally for his efforts to build up and disseminate greater knowledge about man-made climate change and to lay the foundation for measures to counteract such change. Since July of 2009, he has also been the director of the Yale Climate and Energy Institute, which promotes a multidisciplinary approach to learning, research, and the development of strategies to help societies mitigate and adapt to the challenges of local and global climatic changes. Dr. Bashari is active in several international forums dealing with the subject of climate change and its policy dimensions and has received numerous awards and recognitions over the course of his career in climate change science and policy. Dr. Bashari, welcome. It is my pleasure to introduce you to our audience and thank you for lending your valuable insight, experience, and expertise to this series. With that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Good day to you all. Uh, I'm delighted to get this opportunity and I'm going to tell you briefly about the international or the global context in which India is taking certain actions and the kinds of options that India has available in uh, dealing with climate change. So let me first go to slide number one, which essentially gives you the average increase in temperature that has taken place since the begin, beginning of in, industrialization, uh, as well as global average sea level rise. And uh, let me just adjust this setting so that uh, everything is a little more visible. Mm -hmm. All right. So here is the very first diagram you see among these three gives you uh, a plot of changes in average uh, global temperature and you would observe that these are clearly exhibiting a number of fluctuations and that's essentially because uh, the temperature and climate changes as a result not only of human induced uh, factors but also as a result of natural changes. However, what is particularly relevant is to look at the increase that has taken place over the last 
50 or 60 years. And here you would see a perceptible increase in temperatures over this period, going back, let's say, to the middle of the last century. The average uh, increase in this period, in the 20th century in particular, has been 0 0.74 degrees Celsius. Uh, accompanying that is uh, sea level rise, which uh, during the 20th century was about 17 centimeters. And the lowermost diagram gives you the reduction in northern hemisphere snow cover. Uh, and that's essentially the snow cover over the largest area of land, because as you know, it's the northern hemisphere which has the largest area of land on this planet. Let me go to the next slide, and that gives you uh, projections of future increase in temperature, which um, vary from 1.1 degrees Celsius to 6.4 degrees Celsius, uh, and that's linked to a number of plausible scenarios of how the economy, how technology, how demographic changes will take place in the future. Um, here, let me look at two specific values. One is uh, what we call the best estimate at the lower end, which is 1.8 degrees Celsius, and the best estimate at the upper end, which is 4 degrees Celsius. I'll refer to these a little later, but let me go to um, the next uh, slide, which gives you uh, a change in climate leads to changes in extreme weather and climate events. As a matter of fact, we've just brought out a special report uh, the IPCC has on extreme events and disaster and how we might be able to advance adaptation to deal with uh, these extreme events and disaster, which incidentally, at least in three uh, specific cases, uh, are becoming more frequent, more intense. And these are essentially in the nature of heat waves, also in the nature of uh, extreme precipitation events and extreme sea level rise. Uh, linked with increase in average sea level. Now, let me deal with heat waves. I can tell you what happened in 2003 in Europe, and you're all aware of that. Uh, there was a massive heat wave as a result of which uh, about 40,000 people died. Now, in the same year, there was also a major heat wave in the southern part of India, in the state of Andhra Pradesh, where the number of recorded deaths were close to 4,000. The actual number, of course, could have been much higher because simply because records are not as accurately maintained uh, in the developing countries as is the case in the developed world. Well, the chief minister of the state asked me to carry out uh, an investigation of what had happened and how we might be able to avoid such cases in the future. And it's very interesting, and I'm mentioning this essentially because it reflects what happened in a country like India, we had no early warning provided to the people who were going to be affected by the heat waves, and uh, there was hardly any uh, information available on how people might deal with the heat wave if it really hits them. And it's interesting that this situation uh, was um, seen in a, in a condition where Really speaking, everybody has access to the radio, everybody has access to television in some way or the other, but these channels were not used for disseminating information on what was happening. And it's also sad that people didn't know how to deal with uh, the heat stress if they became victims of it, uh, through simple things like oral rehydration therapy. So the point I'm making is there are a lot of so-called uh, low-hanging measures or low-hanging fru fruits which could be utilized to ensure that we adapt to some of these changes in the future. Uh, this incidentally is not um, confined only to India, but this is typical of developing countries in general. And therefore, if we have to take action to deal with some of the extreme events that are going to become more common, more severe in the future, we'll have to ensure that there's proper information systems being put in place uh, as a result of which <coughs> human lives and property can be saved. Um, 
And this is just a picture of more frequent hot days. These are going to increase in the 21st century. In fact, we have projected in the IPCC that uh, those heat waves which currently take place once in 20 years uh, will um, become more prevalent in the future. In other words, the time between these will become more future. And it's entirely possible that by the end of this century, these heat waves which are once in 20 years will actually take place once in two years. Uh, we also know that there will be increasing exposure of people and assets to major causes of changes which results in disasters such as heavy precipitation or heavy rainfall taking place in a very short period of time. And examples of these are the two floods that took place successively in Pakistan in 2010 and 2011. Um, it's also true that in uh, the developing countries, you find a large number of fatalities that take place. As a matter of fact, since 1970, we have seen that over 95% of the natural disaster related deaths took place in the developing countries. So there is also, in that sense, a major global challenge because if there's going to be such a high level of casualty in the developing world, I think this becomes a concern for the rest of the world as well. And here, let me go to uh, issues that relate to the vulnerability of specific populations. Those communities which are dependent on climate sensitive resources, it could be rainfall, it could be, um, uh, you know, stable weather, uh, it could also be stable temperatures. Now, these are uh, communities that are going to be extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. We also need preparedness and planning and in most poor regions of the world this is totally absent. We need a far more sophisticated and a far more extensive public health system and it's also true that in those regions of the world where you have exposure to conflict then the impacts of climate change only exacerbate some of those conditions. And I'd like to draw your attention to what's mentioned at the bottom of this slide. Without appropriate measures, climate change will likely exacerbate the poverty situation and continue to slow down economic growth in developing countries. So we need to be aware of the fact that some of the poorest regions of the world, if anything, might become poorer uh, as a result of uh, the impacts of climate change. And this is happening even in India and I want to mention to you that my institute, Terry, is actually working with a number of state governments uh, to carry out detailed studies that involve sophisticated climate modeling and the institute has a supercomputer because some of these models can only be run on a supercomputer. <coughs> and then we we um, we make sure that using these computer models and climate change models, we downscale the impacts to come up with projections of what might happen in specific parts of the country. And I want to tell you, some of the chief ministers of the states are extremely positive about making use of this knowledge. So I want to highlight the fact that there is a great deal of receptivity to taking in hand adaptation measures in several parts of India. And I think this is also a function of public awareness. The public is now getting deeply concerned about changes in climate and there has been an overall increase in awareness which doesn't mean that people know the scientific reasons behind climate change but they have a kind of a hunch that the climate is changing and therefore there is a political basis for leaderships at the states, at the local level, even in municipalities, getting involved in uh, taking adaptation measures in, in hand. Uh, I want to highlight the importance of uh, climate and stability of climate for food security, uh, particularly in the case of India and South Asia as a whole, we know that with the melting of the glaciers in the Himalayan range, there would be 
serious implications for flows of water in the rivers, uh, which in the northern part of the sub subcontinent originate in the high mountains. And as a result, agriculture downstream and a whole range of other economic activities are likely to suffer. It's also true that a very large number of farmers in India are dependent totally on rain-fed agriculture, so climate change impacts are obviously going to affect them adversely because let's say if you get a lower quantity of rainfall during the year or let's say you have droughts and as it happens in certain parts of the world, <coughs> excuse me, and in South, uh, in South Asia, you find that much of uh, the precipitation that's taking place now <coughs> is taking place in the form of he heavy rainfall. And this has serious implications for agriculture. So I want to highlight the fact that uh, in India, some of those farmers, and this is a very large number, hundreds of millions, who are dependent on rain-fed agriculture would suffer adverse impacts in production of food uh, as a result of climate change. Uh, there would also be impacts on water resources. As a matter of fact, I might mention in India, the projection is that by the middle of this century, we would have about two-thirds of the water available per capita as we have today. Now, that's a very large decline simply because we must consider the fact that as it happens, India doesn't have enough water even to take care of very simple biological needs. And it's a well-known fact that in several parts of the country, people have to travel miles in order to be able to collect one bucket of water. And all of that is likely to be affected adversely as a result of climate change. Uh, urbanization is another uh, factor that we need to be concerned about. And you know, urban locations, as you're all, all aware, also suffer from what one knows as the <coughs> heat island effect. Now, on top of that, if you're going to get a large number of heat waves and more frequent heat waves, then clearly uh, living conditions in urban areas could become very difficult. And that has serious implications for human health and well-being. And we are seeing signs of that in some of the cities in India, <coughs> as is the case around the world. Now, this takes me to another important observation. If you look at the economic mitigation potential globally, that means the possibility of reducing emissions of greenhouse gases, what stands out over here is the potential in buildings. And uh, what you see in the case of this global um, estimation is entirely true in the case of India as well. As a matter of fact, uh, India is a country where there's massive construction activity taking place. And it's particularly important that if we have to deal with mitigation, we ensure that buildings are made as efficient as possible in the use of energy. And this means we need building bylaws, we need policies, we need perhaps incentives and disincentives by which buildings that are constructed today uh, will not be locked into energy intensive patterns of living and usage for the next 60, 70, 80 years as long as the building stands. So here I'm turning to the importance of mitigation and I might mention to you that the National Action Plan on Climate Change in India, which has been essentially initiated through um, the vision of the Prime Minister, <coughs> uh, focuses on what is known as sustainable habitat, of which uh, sustainable buildings are an extremely important part. I also want to highlight the fact that if we want to stabilize the climate uh, of the Earth and ensure that temperatures don't exceed an increase of 2 to 2.4 degrees Celsius, then CO2 will need to peak no later than 2015 if we want to do this on a least cost basis. And I'm mentioning this global figure simply because if a country like India has to grow, which uh, uh, has 
a large problem of poverty, very low levels of energy consumption per capita, then space has to be created by the developed countries to allow uh, the developing countries to reach levels of well-being economically that would clearly imply much greater consumption of energy. Of course, it's also true that the developing countries cannot possibly emulate what has happened in the developed world and we'll have to find trajectories as we brought out clearly in the fourth assessment report of the IPCC uh, which are far more efficient in the use of energy than has been the case with the developed countries. <clears throat> and really speaking, this will not require a very high uh, sacrifice in economic terms because if you look at this global picture of GDP growth without mitigation, you get this red line at the top. But let's say if we were to carry out GDP with stringent mitigation, then this line nearly bends a little downwards. And essentially what this implies is that the level of prosperity that the world would reach in 2030 would at best be postponed by a few months or a year. And that clearly is not a very high price to pay for avoiding some of the worst impacts of climate change. Now, this is where I think India with a population of 1.2 billion uh, also has to look at its contribution to uh, increase in temperature and climate change. And therefore, as the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change clearly says, uh, <clears throat> there is a common but differentiated responsibility over here. So, of course, developing countries like India have a differentiated responsibility, but they are also part of the common responsibility. And therefore, I think in the pursuit of sustainable development, a country like India has necessarily to pursue a path that uh, ensures energy security, that also makes sure that energy is accessible to some of the poorest people in India, which means that we will have to ensure much greater dissemination of renewable energy technologies and a greater use of localized, decentralized renewable energy solutions. <clears throat> and this is something which is uh, clearly included in the National Action Plan on Climate Change. May I mention to you that the National Action Plan consists of eight separate missions. And the very first mission is what is known as the solar energy mission. And this requires and targets setting up 20,000 megawatts of solar power generating capacity in the next 10 years. Now that's fairly ambitious. It's not going to be easy to achieve, but clearly uh, this is what India has set its uh, sights on. And I think given the uh, areas of land where solar capacity could be established without encroaching on other activities and this is essentially in the states of Rajasthan and Gujarat and also given the fact that large parts of India have very high insulation, very high uh, flow of solar energy, this is something which is entirely feasible and I hope India will be able to take care of it. Uh, I also want to mention that uh, India has to deal with the major challenge of energy access. Today we have 400 million people who have no access to electricity and how this can be met is something that I'll show you in a brief video at the end of my PowerPoint presentation. There are energy import vulnerabilities that India has to be concerned about and that's another reason why I think it will have to move to much greater uh, exploitation of renewable energy sources. <clears throat> I uh, also want to emphasize the fact that given the common and differentiated responsibility that India shares with other countries in the world, we have to do something to mitigate emissions of greenhouse gases, which doesn't mean that India has to reduce its emissions, but it will have to ensure that poverty alleviation and economic growth are carried out in a manner that uses fossil fuels as efficiently as possible. And this really means that our transport sector has to be sensitive to this reality, our buildings have to be sensitive to this reality, 
and most definitely uh, industry which uh, consumes about one third of the energy used in the country will also have to move towards much more efficient use of energy. Now, um, we have carried out, my institute, Terry, has carried out a very detailed assessment of what would happen if we continue on a business as usual basis with economic growth and development. Uh, you see on the slide over here there's a macro assumption of population of 1.4 billion, GDP growth rate of about 8% per year, structural shift towards services, that's what's happening uh, in India, <coughs> energy to all lifestyle improvements over time and so on. And we've got a whole lot of other assumptions which go into the modeling that we carried out for looking at the future. And uh, I don't want to go into the details of the scenarios that uh, are described over here, but I'll just go to the next slide, which clearly shows that our fossil uh, import dependency would go up substantially if we pursued a business as usual path. And if you look at the numbers, by 2031, on a business as usual basis, that is the reference energy scenario, we would be importing 750 million tons of oil in 2031 and 1,400 million tons of coal. Now, quite apart from the economic and other security implications of this, I'm not too sure whether the physical infrastructure that we're able to establish will be able to take care of such a large import requirement and moving these large quantities of fossil fuels across the country. <clears throat> uh, power generation capacity. Now here, let me mention that uh, the scenario that you have on the extreme right is uh, by far the most energy efficient scenario. <clears throat> and here, the largest share of capacity will be in the renewable energy areas. Uh, we need to, uh, the macro inferences that we drew were that we have to bring about uh, key transformation with respect to the oil sector, which means even the oil consuming sectors of which transport is by far the most dominant, will have to move towards much greater use of uh, public transport, far more efficient automobiles, uh, better traffic conditions, and so on and so forth. And this again, may I say, is something that every country in the world will probably move towards. Now, renewable energy costs, as the IPCC has found, uh, are already quite competitive in several specific applications. And these are shown over here. Uh, if you look at the costs of, uh, for instance, uh, biomass electricity, if you look at the cost of hydropower, uh, wind electricity, then these are already in the range of uh, fossil fuel based or conventional uh, power generation and therefore uh, there is a case for promoting these on an economic basis. Um, it's also true that technological developments are making some of these technologies far more attractive than they have been in the past. There are economies of scale, as you see in the case of uh, wind power generation technology. Uh, going back to the, the early 1980s, when wind machines were barely 75 kilowatts, we have come a long way in developing these technologies. <clears throat> and the IPCC special report on renewable energy sources and climate change mitigation has also mapped out how the cost of some renewable energy technologies has gone down, uh, even though the kind of expenditure on R&D has been fairly modest over a period of time. So the prospects of for uh, using renewable energy in a country like India look quite bright, and this is something that the government has accepted. As I mentioned, the, uh, the National Action Plan on Climate Change clearly gives a great deal of emphasis to renewable energy development and solar energy in particular. Okay, here is a quote from Mahatma Gandhi uh, which 
highlights the fact that uh, uh, a society, if it has to be responsible, uh, has to deal with possible catastrophe in the future by anticipating it. Uh, as it says in the second part of this quote, the culture can provide social checks and balances to correct for systemic distortion prior to catastrophic failure. So we don't necessarily have to suffer catastrophe uh, to be able to deal with it. If we anticipate it, we can deal with it by taking preemptive measure. Now here let me give you another quote of Mahatma Gandhi, which I think is far more relevant in this instance. Um, Gandhiji was asked whether he wouldn't want India to become as prosperous as Britain and uh, he responded by saying, look, it requires Britain to use half the resources of this planet to reach its level of prosperity and he asked the question, how many planets will India require? So I think in planning for the future, quite apart from uh, the uh, challenge of meeting with uh, the changes in the climate. I think India also has to look at its large population, the kind of uh, demand it's going to place on the natural resources of this planet and therefore I think we need to carve out a very different path of development than what we have seen in recent times. And with this I would request that we play the brief video which in a sense uh, gives you uh, a very practical approach to what I mentioned to you uh, as a pathway that uh, relies heavily on technologies that are resource efficient. So we'll play the video now. Everyone, this should show up in your web. Um, it may go slower depending on the speed of your computer. So we're going to play it. Um, and we'll all hopefully catch up at the end. Bear with us, this is not sharing right away. It does take a while, so please hold, <laughs> your, hold your breath.
All right. Well, hopefully everyone has been able to watch the video without a problem. Uh, we have some questions that have already come in, so we'll start there. Um, oh. I'm trying to get back to our webinar. <laughs> we'll see if we're going to have to watch the video again. <laughs> um, uh, we're going to try to get back to our video. Hopefully people can hear us without a problem and aren't still hearing the video. Um, we have some questions that have come in, so Dr. Prashari, what we'll do is uh, sort of start with these, but folks, please feel free to continue to send them to us, and we can hopefully have a very nice, vibrant conversation here. The first one that we'll talk about comes from Janine Salendi, and she has a technical question asking, where has sea level rise been reporting, I'm sorry, where has sea level rise been reported where it has caused salin uh, salination of agricultural land? Oh, in uh, several of the small island states, for instance, also a large number of low-lying coastal areas. Uh, in fact, in the small island states, uh, there is something called the water lens, and that's the body of water that you find typically right at the center of the island, where you can get some uh, portable, clean drinking water. In a number of islands, this has vanished simply because of intrusion. So, you know, this uh, measurement has taken place extensively in several parts of the world. Uh, and therefore, the conclusions are very clear that saltwater intrusion is taking place as a result of sea level rise. Excellent. And then maybe another um, question about the impacts of climate change. Krishna Bhattam, and forgive me if I'm pronouncing names incorrectly, uh, ask if you could talk a little bit more about the impact of climate change on energy import vulnerability. Well, I mean, if you look at the impacts of climate change, let's say if we're going to get more heat waves, then obviously there would be a greater demand for air conditioning, for uh, refrigeration, uh, and all of this means that uh, the demand for uh, energy would go up, and in the case of countries which are dependent on imports, the import dependency would go up. Uh, and there's a whole variety of other ways in which uh, there would be an impact on the energy sector. Hydro projects, for instance, uh, as a result of changes in precipitation patterns, a number of hydro projects and their catchment areas would be affected as a result of which the design of some of these projects may prove to be unsuitable for the new conditions of precipitation that we are going to encounter in the future. So there's a whole range of uh, impacts on the energy sector that uh, uh, we will see as a result. Uh, excellent. Uh, we had another follow-up question from, um, from Janine, and she wanted to know also about increases in disease like cholera that can be attributed to the existing sea level rise that we're already seeing? <clears throat> well, I mean, um, cholera will certainly uh, increase largely, I would say, on account of floods. And uh, we know that uh, there are also vector-borne diseases that are going to increase. So I wouldn't confine my response only to cholera. Uh, and we must remember that uh, malnutrition is also a source of vulnerability to some of these diseases. So in some parts of the world where uh, food security, agriculture yields are going to decline, uh, you would also have an increase in malnutrition. And that, therefore, those populations become far more vulnerable to cholera and a whole range of other diseases. But floods would certainly be uh, a source of uh, outbreak of diseases of various kinds, including cholera. So I wouldn't link it directly to the sea level rise, but uh, uh, certainly other impacts of climate change would certainly uh, have a link with 
our way of doing it. Thank you. Um, we have one from Jagadish Thakur who asked, um, he's sort of mentioning that you talked about how communicating adaptation behaviors to extreme weather events such as heat waves in Andhra Pradesh could be easily implemented. And he asked, how do you see the role of scientists and especially the Indian network of climate change assessment in taking more proactive steps in communicating those ways to adapt? Well, I think in general, scientists have to communicate the results of their work far better than we've been doing in the past. Uh, and I wouldn't uh, confine this only to any single network or any single entity. I think scientists in general, I would say even in uh, the thousands of colleges and schools that exist throughout the country, have to get focused on this and would need to disseminate the findings of whatever they learn, whatever they, they glean from the work of the IPCC and other scientific uh, communities. Um, and I think if we were all to do that, then certainly the public would be better informed and therefore um, forewarned is forearmed. And I think in the case of adaptation, that certainly applies uh, very aptly. Um, we sort of have two questions and, and hopefully more as we continue talking about the role of the government of India. Uh, and Catherine Grover asks, or mentions that in many countries, the global climate change policies and programs are being implemented by the same domestic institutions and ministries that also implement conventional pollution programs. So I guess the EPA would be an example in the US. Um, but notice that in India, much of the current plan is located within energy ministries. Uh, so she asks, why the government of India has made these institutional choices in their national climate action plan? Well, frankly, I think that's a very sensible approach because if you're going to get <coughs> one ministry that's already saddled with a large number of responsibilities uh, in terms of protecting the environment, also take on something as ambitious, as innovative as the National Action Plan on Climate Change, it would be very difficult to bring about the involvement of all stakeholders. For instance, if you're talking about the mission for sustainable habitat, unless the urban development ministry is involved in it, you're not going to get any action whatsoever. Um, so it's for this reason that different ministries have been made the focal points for different missions. And I think that's really a practical way by which uh, you embed some of these programs in the activities of the ministries that are actually best qualified to deal with some of the uh, subjects. So um, I, I personally think this is a very sensible approach. Uh, of course, there is the big problem of who's going to monitor all this program. Um, and essentially, it will have to be the Prime Minister's office. Uh, and I hope that will happen effectively. Um, we have another question uh, relating to sort of India and the state of research. Bansari Saha asks, what's the state of research on mitigation and adaptation policies for India? And is there modeling and estimation of the mitigation costs and exactly how this thing might be? And to be quite honest, there isn't enough um, research being carried out on these subjects in India. There's a very small handful of institutions that are really doing assessments of uh, mitigation as well as adaptation options and estimating costs. Uh, my institute is certainly heavily involved. We've been working on climate change issues since 1988. But um, what you really need is maybe a few hundred institutions involved in work in this area. Because not, not merely because of climate change and what needs to be done about it, but also because related to climate change are a number of co-benefits that we need to look at carefully. And I should also say that uh, action on climate change has to be mainstreamed with development policy, whether it's in respect of mitigation or adaptation. Uh, unless it becomes part of development policy, uh, you're, going to, you're going to be dealing only with the fringes of the challenge. Uh, so I think we need a lot more research. We need 
many more institutions getting involved in work in this area and on looking at development per se, development strategies per se, by which we can at the same time bring about sustainable development and ensure uh, meeting the challenge of climate change effectively. Um, this is another question that sort of goes back to the political context and India's domestic policy. Um, Catherine Grover again notes that the level of engagement by the government of India in international negotiations has noticeably increased uh, in recent years. And so she asks if you can describe the domestic political context uh, that explains this change in foreign policy regarding climate change. I'm not too sure whether there's been any substantial change in uh, policy. Um, it's um, it's really more a matter of perceptions and projections, uh, but I think the Indian government's policy has remained by and large quite consistent over a period of time. Uh, yes, India is getting a lot more attention now simply because growth has been quite healthy in the past few years. So uh, I think the global community feels that India is going to become a larger contributor naturally to emissions of global emissions of greenhouse gases. So there's probably been a lot more uh, interest focused on India, but I'm not too sure whether India's policy has changed very much. Uh, it's been largely consistent all these years. Um, Josh Wesley asks, Eversol writes that you could discuss the role that land use policy uh, will play sort of in addition, I guess, to the energy and other policies we already talked about, but land use policies in India uh, and their role in meeting climate goals. Well, that's a very complex subject. I mean, land use policy will certainly be important in terms of uh, ensuring that uh, we don't encroach with population growth on some of the productive agricultural areas in the country that we ensure that forests and forest cover actually expand. Uh, we would also have to make sure that uh, in order to protect <coughs> uh, life and property, we um, have very clear zoning restrictions in coastal areas so that people are not exposed to the danger of sea level rise or coastal flooding. So I mean it's a very complex and a very vast subject and I think uh, every aspect of climate change will have to be seen in defining land use policy in, in parts of the country. And again, in a country as diverse as India, this will vary from place to place, from mountains to uh, coastal areas to agricultural grades to cities and towns and so on. Um, we sort of have another one that gets in at one of the strategies, and that's renewable energy. Uh, Tanya, I'm going to pronounce the name incorrectly, Rebotnia, asks uh, or notes that renewable energy is, is large and land intensive, um, you know, particularly when we talk about resources like solar and wind. And she asks, you know, what are the situations uh, sort of on the ground in India where that land is readily available and the development trade off, you know, for cities and other uh, more urban areas? Well, <coughs> I think if you look at uh, the land requirements for renewable energy, certainly for large installations, if you're going to set up uh, thousands of megawatts of uh, uh, power generating capacity, whether it's photovoltaics or solar thermal, you would need larger areas of land. There's no doubt about it, and therefore you would have to limit uh, such projects to states like Rajasthan or Gujarat. <coughs> Excuse me. Or even some arid parts of Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Maharashtra, where, for instance, you're not likely to compete with forests or agriculture or urban agglomerations. Uh, but at the same time, let's remember that, you know, if you have to set up, for instance, rooftop photovoltaic systems, uh, then, you know, this could easily be done in urban areas. Most uh, urban locations in India don't have uh, many tall buildings. They don't have multi-story buildings. They have most, the bulk of the buildings are single or double story. So, you know, they are ideally suited for establishment of rooftop systems and 
so on. So I think the space problem is really not a major constraint on the expansion of renewable energy uh, technology. And particularly in rural areas, if you are going to enhance uh, electricity supply, I think uh, even in economic terms, uh, renewable energy and uh, decentralized uh, systems would prove far more attractive than uh, extending the grid to these locations. And those are not likely to be land intensive. Uh, in fact, in several villages where they have been implemented, these programs have not conflicted at all with uh, other uses, other productive uses of land. So I think uh, there's plenty of scope for uh, using existing areas of land without imposing on useful economic applications uh, if we are to expand the production. Uh, perhaps on that same line, you know, when we talk about useful and productive uses of land, um, Krishna Gautam again noted sort of the energy and food conflict and perhaps that plays also out in sort of the use of these um, unused or undeveloped agricultural spaces. Do you see that there is a conflict between energy and food? Um, Krishna has noted that the, I guess, looks like the rich side of the population uh, support energy or need energy and the poor people just need food, you know, so what is, is there a conflict between the sort of energy versus Well, there would, there would be a conflict if you were taking productive agriculture in areas for producing energy, but that's not the case with India, it hasn't happened so far. I mean, even the, uh, the sort of laid down percentage of ethanol that the sugar industry is supposed to provide for blending with gasoline has really not been implemented. So, as far as India is concerned, that conflict doesn't exist at all. Uh, if you're talking about disparities in energy, consumption between the rich and poor, then that's true of everything that is consumed in India. Energy is not the only commodity where you've got these huge disparities. That is an affliction uh, of Indian society at large, where uh, certainly the disparity between rich and poor has increased, I would say, at an alarming rate. Um, sure. Again, still questions coming in. This is great. Um, Jagadish Thakur notes that, you know, we've been talking a lot about, you know, how the issue of climate change within India has uh, domesticated from the late 1980s, and he asked how you feel the Indian response to climate change has evolved over the years, and asked whether we can get the Indian government to tune up if we were to use its, uh, you know, change its adaptation-related policy measures. Well, I think as far as adaptation uh, policies are concerned, quite apart from the Indian government, there's need for creating capacity at the local level because I think the bulk of adaptation capability and capacity uh, has to be developed at the local level because that's where adaptation can take place. Uh, so you really need a package of measures at the national, at the state, as well as the local level. Uh, and I think some of that is happening slowly. But that's also a reason why you need to bring science to the doorstep of decision makers at um, the state level, at the local level. And we as an institute are trying to do that in several states of the country. And uh, we find the response has been very hard. Um, sort of noting that receptivity that the local governments have for these adaptation measures, there are more of us, whether it's in Terry's experience, there has been that same receptivity at the local level to measures that limit things like energy use or greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and are those actions being mainstreamed uh, at the same time that these local governments are dealing with economic development policies? Well, to be quite honest, that's been very, very slow. And local governments have really not been all that proactive in bringing about improvements in energy efficiency, uh, ensuring that uh, say, even building bylaws uh, become much more responsive to the need for uh, efficient use of energy, of water, and other natural resources. So I think there's a long way to go in that regard. Uh, we really haven't achieved very much in this uh, 
correction. Um, this is sort of a longer question, so bear with me as I sort of work through it. Um, Lakshmi Krishnan, who's joining us from Yale, notes that there's, um, you know, an acknowledgement by the Indian Prime Minister as well as ministers around the world um, about the threat of climate change and sort of demanding action, but perhaps less um, meaningful progress when it comes to developing sustainably and meaningfully. Um, and so she asks, you know, given that there's so much emphasis on sort of individuals, not just sort of the grassroots, but sort of the individual perspectives of single ministers, um, you know, what, what does the international negotiation process look like and how can it advance to make politicians, and, and I would add to that, institutions more responsive over the long term rather than sort of a, um, a, a, political, a politically driven instability? Well, frankly, there's no silver bullet in these matters. I mean, if you're uh, functioning as a democracy, then I think the ultimate analysis uh, what would happen would essentially be a reflection of the will of the people and the priorities that people place on their leaders. Uh, and therefore, I would say that one important step that all of us must take is uh, in respect of informing the public and giving them knowledge by which they realize what needs to be done to deal with climate change. And that will ensure that leaders uh, will get elected on the basis of promises and performance uh, related to what we expect them to do. So I, I, I think it's, uh, it's a complex issue and uh, there are several initiatives that would be required, but I would say informing the public and uh, spreading knowledge is by far the most effective. Well, that would certainly sort of be one big strategy that um, can go a long way. Um, we have time for just one more question that comes from us, or to us, from Basari Saha. And he asked, what is your sense of whether there would be hard emission reduction targets in India, and if so, under what timeline? And is there much discussion of using market-based instruments rather than command and control type regimes to control emissions? I think you will have a combination of both. There will be regulation, there will also be incentives and disincentives. And uh, that's already started happening. And for instance, in the case of energy efficiency, uh, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency is trying some methods by which we provide incentives and disincentives. This year's budget, the finance minister, I believe, has imposed a higher tax on uh, SUVs and larger vehicles. So I think all of this will happen, but at the same time, you will need regulation, you will have regulation. So what we can foresee is a combination of both of them. And uh, I don't think it will be one without the other. Is expect both regulation as well as fiscal measures. Well, thank you, Dr. Prashari. This has been a really excellent discussion, um, but we are out of time, so we're going to go ahead and stop here. Uh, thank you to Dr. Prashari for the excellent insights, um, but also thank you to everyone who submitted questions and listened online. We had a, a great conversation. Thank you for everyone for staying engaged and, and following up with us in the Q&A session. If you'd like to revisit this discussion, we'll be uploading the recording after the event, and we'll send everyone who registered an access link by the end of the week. Uh, I'd also like to make you aware of the next webinar in our series, which will be held just a few weeks from now on April 10th at 5 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. This webinar will focus on Japan and will feature Mr. Nobuo Tanaka, who is the Global Associate for Energy Security and Sustainability at the Japan Institute of Energy Economics. Uh, and he, he is the former director of the International Energy Agency. Invitations for that will go out later this week with more information, so please look out for that in your inbox if you're interested in attending. On behalf of the Yale Center for Environmental Law and Policies and our partners at WRI and EDF, thank you very much again to Dr. Kashari. And thank you to all of our attendees. We will look forward to talking again at the end of our next webinar. Thank you.